minutes. Right. Again, so we're trying to be in day three of our ramp talk. So to all of us who had confidence in it yesterday, right? So I hope you had a good rest after all the festivities. And also for everyone who was there, unfortunately, I hope you had a good rest as well. So we're going to begin um, this morning's premium speech. And afterwards, we'll make our morning announcements as usual. But that's the end of the speech first. And to do that, let me invite Professor Louise Hummings from the Department of English, who will introduce our female speaker this morning, Professor Louise. Welcome, everyone. I am delighted to be able to introduce the third plenary speaker of this round conference. Professor Elena Smino is the director of the ESRC Center for Corpus Approaches to Social Science at Lancaster University in the UK. She is also the head of linguistics and the English language department of Lancaster. Professor Semino was educated at the University of Genoa before moving to the UK, where she completed her MA and PhD at the University of Lancaster. Her research interests are very wide ranging and include issues in stylistics, metaphor theory and analysis, the medical humanities, and health communication. Professor Semino's work in metaphor theory and analysis examines metaphor in literary texts and the reading of non-literary text types, including political speeches, newspaper language, scientific communication, and health communication. Professor Semino has led an interdisciplinary team that worked on the ESRC-funded study metaphor in end-of-life care. Her expertise in metaphor and related areas is evidenced by the publication of over 80 peer-reviewed international publications. Recently, she co-edited the Rutledge Handbook of Metaphor and Language with Sophia Denman of University College London. With this wealth of research expertise, we are truly honored to have her address us today on the real world applications of metaphor theory to the context of healthcare. I ask you to extend a warm welcome to Professor Samino for her talk, Applying Metaphor in Healthcare. Okay, thank you very much. Thank you for being here the morning after the night of talk. Um, how does it work out the sound in the back? What do you know this front end? Okay, not too loud. It's the, uh, the danger with me is that I'm bursting the ears now. Okay, so um, when I was invited um, to give this talk, um, I was encouraged to talk about the applications of medical research. And so I'd be really primarily with that aim there in ground. Um, but I will be introducing different research projects that aim at then practical applications. More specifically, um, I'll give you just a tiny little background on medical illness, and then I'll talk about three different areas of work. And I'm going to do it in uh, order of recency. So I'll start with the most recent project that has still had potential for applications. I haven't been applied yet on uh, methods for voice theory in uh, schizophrenia. And then I will end with uh, a project that has been on for a long time that has already had some kind of application on methods for cancer. And in between, um, I'll talk about a different project on multimodal genesis and chronic pain. And of course, you'll have realized that I'm the third senior speaker in the world in the world to talk about genesis for pain. We didn't plan this, but that's why I came back. And of course, as you can imagine, I will have quotations from people who uh, are affected by all three conditions. So you, you need to be warned that that is going to be the case. Um, and then, as I was thinking about this uh, talk, uh, I also reflected on the things I've learned in the process of trying to apply finally to the research network. So those lessons I learned will pop up um, as I go along. Um, 
Most of them would be about natural specific, and some of them would be about trying to apply the findings of research more generally. So here we go. Um, I, I, I actually have a slide on my definition of metaphor and me, just to cover all bases, but I decided to leave you guys on me. Uh, but if anybody wants to ask specifically about my separate education, I'm very happy to answer those questions later. So, as you all know, um, illness is one of the experiences that we often talk about metaphorically. Um, and that is because the illness is sensitive, it's subjective, it's sometimes associated with stigma and shame. So, it's the kind of thing that, in terms of conceptual medical field, turns out to start with the medical. And if I had to generalize, there are two main lines of work for metaphor and illness. One line is looking at what kinds of metaphors people use to talk about and to actually think about, conceptualize different kinds of uh, experiences uh, related to illness. So for example, if we take pain, uh, last year I looked at metaphors for the experience of pain only. Um, and then there are some lines of research that are, in a sense, applied right from the beginning. So for example, Gallagher and others uh, produce a book of metaphor for uh, people who suffer from chronic pain. And that book of metaphor was aimed at helping people reconceptualize their pain experiences in such a way that they would cope better and they would be less likely to catastrophize. In other words, end up in a vicious circle where you experience pain, that pain leads to fear of pain, and the fear of pain is pain, pain more likely. Um, and uh, I'll just touch a little bit on uh, similar aspects of my work that I've done. Okay, so um, the first um, project I'm going to tell you about, and the one that I've been engaged with most recently, more recently uh, is to do with methods for voice hearing and schizophrenia. So, um, this I have one slide where I can give you all the background you need about voice hearing, because I can't take it from my so it's a little bit just a little bit dense in the slide. So, first of all, uh, a sizable minority of the population hear voices that other people cannot hear. And the technical terms for that is auditory verbal hallucination. However, hearing voices that other people cannot hear isn't necessarily linked to having a mental illness. In some cases, it's a profession. If you're a medium, that's, that's what you do. Or in some religious traditions, that is very kind of bad. However, persistent hallucinatory experiences with voices are one of the uh, uh, criteria for diagnosis of schizophrenia, and indeed, the majority of people who have schizophrenia diagnosis hear voices that other people do not hear. The crucial thing about voice hearing, as I've already suggested, is not so much whether you hear voices that other people can hear or not, it's how you experience those voices, and in particular, if those voices are distressing. And in turn, distress is linked to a variety of factors, including particularly your perception of whether or not you can control your voices, and your perception of the power relationship with your voices. This is the kind of thing that clinical psychologists look at. Typically, in order to deal, in order to assess distress and its determinants, uh, voice hearers are asked directly whether or not they hear the control their voices, whether whether they perceive the voices as powerful or not. So there are explicit questions in clinical interviews about this. And what uh, I've been working on with some colleagues in the studio at the moment is exploring what linguistic analysis and particularly metaphor analysis can offer as an alternative way of looking at how people experience their voices and in turn whether and how those voices might be. So here's the colleague, Sophia Levin, who already mentioned. She's the lead on this project at Moonlight and Fellows London. And they're the super collaborators, Federico Barreto, who's a clinical psychologist in Manchester, and Agnes Massida, who's a regular international college. So what did you do? Um, Filippo has collected 10 interviews with voice leaders who have a clinical diagnosis of schizophrenia. And during those interviews, some of the questions that are asked are aimed at assessing perceptions of control and degree and uh, mode of distress. So those interviews included those questions. That kind of questionnaire is known as Tyra. Uh, these interviews were transcribed and they were anonymized. 
We then came along with linguists and, tra and started working in Filippo, and we analyzed, uh, we found the behaviors of the London, uh, reports of interactions with voices in those interviews. Because then you see one of the things that people do in those interviews, they talk about and report their interactions with the voices in their lives. We look at a bunch of things, but also today we're talking about metaphor. We wanted to see how the findings of our analysis related to the SIRAC score, the other word, the assessment that the clinical psychologists did of control and distress. And so for that purpose, the bits of the interviews that are related to those that ask questions specifically about this thing were removed. So we didn't know the answers to those questions. We just analyzed uh, reports of interaction. And specifically, we wanted to see how, in the metaphorical scenarios that people used, uh, who was in control, who would be in control, and what possible uh, solutions were there if there were problems in these theoretical worlds here. And a crucial uh, concept for us, we talked about the work on metaphysical cancer later on, is uh, empowerment and disempowerment in a metaphorical scenario. And our definition of empowerment is to do with the degree of agency that somebody has within a metaphorical scenario where the agency <coughs> is welcomed by the person. So this project also taught me a lesson that I, in a sense, already implicitly um, had worked out in previous projects. So when you want to collaborate uh, across disciplines, uh, you often have to start, and actually I'd like to start, with questions about language or about entities that the people in the other discipline have. And so sometimes the question I ask when I'm trying to set up collaboration is, uh, I'm a linguist, in an ideal world, what kind of questions would you like to bring this to us? And then sometimes the question is something we can answer, sometimes not. Uh, but it is an important aspect of collaboration and toxicity, and some of the time uh, to start from questions that are outside the field. Okay, so um, you won't be surprised that some of the metaphors that uh, voice theorists use to talk about the interaction with voices are broadly speaking to do with violence, violence scenarios, we call them violence scenarios. And they're kind of loosely related to what Lakers and Johnson call acting as war. Uh, so, to give a couple of examples of the participant there and uh, the numbers uh, distinguishing from the system. So, uh, one person said, I feel like lying down because I get tired of fighting him, him in front of the policies. Uh, but if I try to fight through it, he shall bring it out. So, you've got that fighting as an ethical for the interaction with the policies. Now, what we found is that. The people who use more violent metaphors, and especially if they use them frequently and creatively, tend to be the ones who are more distressed. We've only got 10 people so far, so we can't make a very strong play. But there seems to be a correlation uh, uh, between those metaphors and distress. And I want to show you one particularly distressed participant, thesis. Uh, just to give you a flavor of uh, what, how thesis talks about the voices here in the last round. I've lived in the bathroom for years. And what had happened is just say, it's going to be nice and it's starting a new day. But for me, it did not make any difference because one day it's wrong to another. So all of a sudden, it could be any time after midnight, it could be one minute past midnight, a brand new day, and all of a sudden, the boss would say he was the class. So this person is very much handled in his ability to live the life that he wants to be a very boss. Now, physics is violence methods for the interaction of the voices are frequent. They're often extended and creative. And they tend to involve extreme aggression. So, uh, when the, this is the voice speaking to him, when that nurse leaves, we're going to get hammered. And then just imagine he's talking to the interviewer. There's a gang of men out there waiting to battle you, a gang of men waiting to battle you now. You do everything you can to stay in there because you know what's waiting for you out there, and that's what he's like. And he also presents himself in these metaphorical scenarios as unable to fight back. It's like trying to fight with one hand and fight behind your back. I mean, it's like if me and you had a fighting this room now and you had one arm tied behind your back and I had both arms free, it wouldn't be a fair fight, and that's what this is like. So these are physics's violence metaphors. I'll just show you another example of the kind of metaphors that physics uses as we have I had an example on a moment. Okay, one of the conventional ways in which voices are talked about is in terms of coming and going. 
right? Even if they're kind of head of the first in the Cana or Bamboo region and, and devices come and go. Um, a variant of, and this is very conventionalized, but then there are some more creative categories that use the idea of the economies of the Cana. And P60, P60 uses a particularly disempowering version of that anecdote. He says, you can say I've got some good news for you and give me some good news now. I try to get that into my head, but there's no room for it. Yes, because like I said before, that would be a square head going in a round hole. One thing. My head is full of negative, absolutely full of them, chocolate, full of negative, and that is what he's done. So he presents his head as a container that the voice is filled with negative things, and there is no space for it. And so in the metaphorical scenario, there's nothing we can do. So let's have a look at some of the other people. Um, so some participants use metaphors that suggest uh, a more equal relationship, and sometimes even mutually supportive. So one person talks about support, or what comes to the conventional metaphor, I try and support her, they try to support me. Um, another person also uses a metaphor to do with construction, I do have to give myself up, and the voices do really fill me up a little bit. And then there are a bunch of structures that are sort of stimulates, they're at the edge of figurativeness, I think, but they talk about uh, the relationship with voices in terms of in-group relations. So uh, P33 says, yeah, it was a bit like a little group gathering that's all working together. So this is the person and the voices in group gathering, my friends. And then uh, uh, P13 says, I treat them like a system. So we've got then a contrast between different kinds of methods that people tend to do in their relationship with voices. And the different methods tend to correlate with different degrees of distress. Lesson number two here is that when you're talking about metaphor, as you all know, uh, one of the things you have to handle is the fact that everybody has a notion of metaphor in their head, but it's a way of using it from yours. And one of the things that happened in uh, an interdisciplinary uh, context where we were presenting our findings was that uh, at least some of the participants were expecting that we would talk about the voices themselves as a metaphor for something. And I remember a moment when we realized only when we've gone a certain distance into the presentation that that is what some of the participants were expecting. And then, of course, you've got to sort of pedal back and say, but actually, that's not that we can't do that for other things, although it may well be that it's a valid definition. So, handling that or sometimes preempting that uh, sort of misunderstanding goes deeper. So, overall, in this project, uh, we found that metaphors can be seen as a signal. As well as the determinant of distress associated with hearing voices. The, the metaphors that are particularly associated with distress, the violence metaphors, like the ones I've shown you, uh, but also metaphors where the voices are stuck inside the head, they're stationary, and also this idea of a, of, of a container that has no space to go. The, the metaphors that are associated with coping are more to do with kinship and also wholeness, the idea of the metaphors as a part, that of voices as a part. And the difference seems to be to do with the kind of metaphorical scenario that is involved and relations within that scenario. So for each of the case studies I'll present, I'll finish with the potential applications and then where we are, right? Both in, both in terms of effective phase or temporary phase. Um, so what we've seen is that, and also we've uh, been able to establish an interaction with psychologists, is that this kind of analysis has the potential to complement existing or traditional approaches to the assessment of uh, distress. Uh, the advantages of our approach are that they, they don't rely on direct questions about distress because people may not be totally aware of how distress they are, and also they may, may always be able to tell you, so willing to tell you. So they got an advantage in that sense. They also can lead to new, to new insights into the phenomenology of voice hearing, understanding better what it's like to be a voice because of the nuance we can add. Uh, and we can need interventions, I can't talk about that, but they, they, they can feed into different kinds of interventions, including if you've heard the other therapy, therapy for this kind of uh, issue. I, I, I don't know if you <laughs> Progress so far. Okay, this is the thing. We got something from UCL, but every other representation is very so far. Mm -hmm. So there we are. Um, oh no, I'm going to say that there is a bit of this in a gratification that succeeds, but basically we have two failures uh, that I'm sure you're familiar with, uh, with funding. 
And also, and this is a, 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 an important point, our approach is more time consuming than saying to people, do you take control of your voices and how distracted you find it correct? People ask those questions very, very rapidly. We take a long time to do the analysis. So we need to show that there's value added in doing the our kind of time consuming analysis. Otherwise, people would say, yeah, fair enough, but we can do that. Um, so that's the objective. Positive new elements, we had uh, very positive. Uh, feedback from uh, people in different areas, including clinical psychologists. We've got a network of potential collaborators, including experts by experience. And sooner or later, we might get funded with that network. And we just had an article accepted in the journal Psychology uh, with conditions uh, that we were accepted. Okay, so that was our first case study. Second study is doing uh, a non network, the pain. So I'm going to start with what we're doing on here. So pain is the basic and fundamental of human experience. And when it works well, it is essential to survival. Uh, there's a genetic condition where people don't feel pain, and it's a catastrophic condition. Um, there's a, in the literature, there's a basic distinction between nociceptive pain, which is pain that results from damage to body tissues, like when you burn the skin, um, and uh, in opposition to that, neuropathic pain is pain that's caused by problems in the nervous system. And many, uh, like migraines, etc., the pain doesn't result from uh, physical damage, but you still experience the pain. Uh, neuropathic pain, in particular, the challenge of communication is hard to describe, and also people have the problem that they look, we look physically fine when we're in certain types of pain. And this is one, just one example of a participant in a project saying, to make family and friends understand that even hard when you look good, you'll be fine. I found it extremely hard to make doctors understand the extent of my pain. Okay. English and other languages too have very few words that have basic meaning to do with pain, and they're very indistinct. Pain and its various forms, hurt, ache, and so on. And so even in the medical literature, it is well known that a pain is very often described as quality, and people have worked on it, including and others. And these are some of the metaphors that our convention used to talk about pain, causes of physical damage, temperature, etc. These are all things that we did. So I've been working with a bunch of people, these are the three main collaborators that are happening with an artist, John Dorchester, who is a pain clinician and one of the leading psychologists. And the collaboration started because of two projects that were done in specialist pain clinics in London, where they were the artists work with chronic pain sufferers to create photographic images that express the pain of each individual. And we'll see some in a moment. Uh, it was a process of co-creation. And these are some of the examples. Um, you could spend a lot of time on these, but they're mostly visual metaphors. And they tend to be accompanied when they're exhibited or published in books by verbal description of what the picture tries to convey. Okay, so after the project, Deborah ended up with about 70 images, and they were printed on cards, right? So uh, it was them to take the pain cards. Oh yeah, lesson number three. Well, this is quite interesting. In the early days of my collaboration with Deborah and the artist, uh, uh, we were talking, and I said, um, these are really interesting because they're all visual metaphors. And uh, she said to me, I don't know, they're not metaphors, they're true. Yeah. And I said, but Deborah, when I call something a metaphor, I think it's really important. I'm not dismissing it. So I had to learn that in some contexts, calling something a metaphor may be perceived to be a dismissal of what is what is. So again, it's to do with an awareness of how the terms we use by the people. So having got these pain cards, uh, a new project also funded by UCL, uh, tried to investigate whether those cards could be useful in clinical settings. And so uh, a study was set up where these cards were made available in the working homes and specialist pain clinics. And people were told that if they wanted to, while they were waiting for their appointments, they could select a bunch of those cards and take them into consultation. And then we were able to read the interaction with the consultation provision reported, and we wanted to find out what difference the pain with the pain cards make. So 17 consultations. Uh, with those images, and uh, what we did, at least what we've done so far, is isolated the bits of those consultations where the cards are actively being used, 
and compare those basic interactions with everything else in those transformations. And I refer in the next few slides, when I say card data, those are the sections of the consultation where the cards are actively being used, and the rest are referred to as rest data. We also have a set of consultations with the same consultants and no pay cards, but two different patients. Uh, there's too many variables that one would have to uh, try to control. Now, one thing that is just an observation is that when the card is actively being used, the patients speak relatively more in comparison with the consultants. So the word counts suggest that the uh, the are enable the uh, patients to occupy more of the conversation as well. But then what I did, I used focus standards, and essentially some of you may be familiar with this, some not. But basically, there is a software tool whereby you load up your data and um, everything is every word you see is a tag for a semantic field, like war or movement or something like that. And then you're able to compare different data sets. So I was able to say to the software, look at car data and look at the frequency of each semantic field in car data, compare it with rest data, and give me as an output the semantic fields that they do much more frequently in car data with statistically significant effect than rest data. Okay? And that's PS, uh, the statistical significance measures are not going to that. Here I want to show you what happens when you take the patient's language and you make that comparison. So which semantic fields are used much more often by patients when the car is used? Some of the stuff is trivial. So the software picks up the fact that the cars are mentioned. And so arms and crafts in the semantic domain it comes up with three, and so that's not very interesting. I'll show you interesting ones. So these are all overused semantic domains in uh, patients when they talk about the cars, okay, as opposed to the rest of the time. Uh, there's a whole bunch of semantic fields that are, if you have source domains, the method for the same situation. Temperature, electricity, and electrical equipment, those are actual words, for example, in bold is the semantic field labels. Constraint, violent, and angry, and then there's more references to body parts. So, in essence, what happens around the time is that there are more metaphorical descriptions of data space. In addition, the, these semantic fields are also overused, totally with words such as feel and degree maximizers, with words such as literally, which of course are the part of the description, most completely, etc. So, let's have a look at feel. This is a performance of feel, part of, from the patients, and I'll show you that they tend to do three things with feel. One is describe the pain itself. Um, the pain is a severe activity from one part. One is to talk about what, uh, including in clinical settings, is referred to as the impact of the pain on the person's life. I feel that there are some things I'm not able to do anymore. And another is to do, again, after the first part, to reference to emotional states. I feel lost. So then, with this method, you can go a bit deeper and look more qualitatively at the kinds of things that people reveal when they're talking about a child. So I'll just give you one example. Oh yeah, I should also say, I have sometimes been told, oh, but that's a silly. Um, and, and I have to explain, actually, um, for some purposes, I don't make that distinction. But people say, oh my god, you're an expert in that word. You can't distinguish between an expert and an expert. And that's what they want So that's something that's not right. And you immediately move your first into the distinction. All right, so an example of what happens around the cards in terms of being emotional states. So, this is one of the cards, and then you can see, so basically, you can see that there's this chair and this rug, and there's a little dog here, right? right now. So, this was done by somebody else. One person took that card into the consultation and then explained it like this. And here, I just give you what the patient says the, the clinician intervenes and supports. This is when I'm completely like a rag doll. So she takes the image and then she turns it into a purple snake, right? And then explains how she's like a rag doll. When I'm so exhausted, I can't walk and I just want to go, oh, it's my I've had enough day. When you go, oh God, what's the point of doing stuff? Now, the, in, the references to suicidal ideation in this data all are all around the time. And this is interesting, right? That somehow, that the patient is using the card not to say what the pain feels like in this case, but how the pain makes her feel. 
And then the, so that one is because of emotional disclosure by nature. And the other one is to do with social relations. And I hate, I hate doing it, but I'm currently like permanently making up excuses for not going to exist. I don't want to say I'm in pain because it's like, oh God, change the record. I hear myself saying it. So I'm constantly going and I'm making up all these stories like, oh, I forgot somebody's calling, or I've got to do this, and it's all lies. I mean, I've got such lovely friends that I'd like to do all the time. So here's the first review something else about that is impossible. So saying, which is that she lies to her friends when they want to go out because she's more to the same as you, and she feels bad about it. So this is, we saw the overuse of steel, and here you can see how the card is sometimes used to for emotional disclosure uh, of the So I've shown you what the visual images for the card seem to do. They seem to help patients take place, or rather patients use them to speak more. Uh, they are used to as part of the description of the the same sensation for emotional disclosure. There are many applications, right? Uh, <clears throat> especially because of this greater involvement of patients and how to be used. And also the ability to articulate both the physical and emotional aspects of brain experiences. So far, what difficulties have we had? Well, when we find that patients speak more around the class, our reaction as a group of researchers was brilliant, right? This is, you know, Deborah saying this is democratizing, it uses the power of differential initiation patients, it's a great thing. But some clinicians would say, I don't want patients to walk online about this stuff. I just want to answer my questions and I can diagnose them. So the interpretation of the, the, that finding is dependent on which perspective you take. And certainly, we had plenty of successes, which I've shown you, but we, we had rejection after rejection after rejection from the main pain conferences when we have offered workshops about this. And then we can try every time and uh, get them back. Although we had some, some successes, but <clears throat> the main work that we're going to do that. In terms of positive development, however, there's been a lot of interest. And the Lancet, which is a, a procedure medical journal in the UK, invited us to write some pieces about the and they were published. So uh, we've had some success. Okay, finally, uh, that's from cancer. So these are the colleagues, there's loads of them. Um, I just point out the non-linguist, Sheila Payne, is a head of blood care specialist, and Alison Burr, who's an oncologist. Some of the others, some of you would know, so we back again. Okay, so here I'm not telling you anything new. The dominant method works for cancer, certainly in the UK, involve antagonistic scenarios, before the violence metaphors, like the one you were to see, where cancer is depending. And uh, the patient is fighting, uh, and that's the society is fighting, etc. There was a presentation yesterday about this. I don't think I need to go into detail. And of course, there is a substantial literature that thinks critically about these kinds of metaphors, uh, and notably, starkly, Harry Vivas, who was on that book, Hidden uh, as a Metaphor, where she made a, a very strong critique of military metaphors. And since then, there have been many. Uh, criticisms of this metaphor, there was a paper on this yesterday uh, that showed how uh, there are articles in newspapers that criticize this metaphor. And indeed, in the UK, uh, since at least 2007, policy documents on cancer and end of life have very deliberately used the metaphor of the cancer journey and avoided these kind of militaristic uh, metaphors. So you've got cancer journey, and then the, the NHS, the National Health Service in the UK, uses a notion of pathway for and models of care and patients are different pathways. So that's the kind of background. So we uh, got funding from the British government to do a project that looked at uh, medical and life care, but particularly in relation to cancer. So we looked at, we had data from three groups of people, patients, carers, and healthcare professionals. Carers here are unpaid carers, so somebody looking after their spouse or their mother or their child. And for each group, we collected semi structured interviews and uh, large quantities of online forum posts for a total of uh, one and a half million dollars. Um, here's another lesson, but it's not specific to metaphor. I, I often use this slide in presentations to healthcare professionals or researchers. And one time I was doing this and I was going along, and I, I see some commotion in the audience and people sort of looking at each other. And I said, What's wrong? And they said, how do you 
I'm going to do some of that work. And I said, you know, I'm going to make myself a work. So they, they, they thought that I would have 100,000 people who would take the way back. So that was another thing. <laughs> don't, don't take for granted that you're a visionary writer. You all know, right? So now I always say, those are words. And that I'm a that can't kind of work. Right. So what did we do? Again, I'm not going to go into the detail of the methods, but we took a, a sample of uh, the data about how to start work and analyzed that manually using mix um, to identify all the relevant metaphors and metaphors about the experience of cancer and the life. And then we use corpus methods to scale up the whole analysis to the corpus. Uh, if you want to know more about the method, it's published, but you can ask me. So this is just to impress you with numbers. These are the main uh, groups of metaphors we identified violence, jerky, restraint, animals, openness, sports and games, religion and magic, obstacles, corners and machines. And these are the number of occurrences, uh, patients, carers, and professionals. So these are just raw instances uh, of the data sets of different sizes. And what I focus on is very briefly violence and jerky metaphors because those are the ones people can talk about. Uh, I should also say, Something about metaphor identification and talking to non readers. Um, I've, I've sort of found out that there's, there's a line to, there's a fine line between uh, raising people's awareness about conventional metaphors and putting them off within the CA context. Uh, so, one example is I remember talking to her professionals and uh, she would say, Oh, we, we don't use war metaphors anymore because we are aware of it. We might even use and I found good. I said, and uh, do you talk about cancer or treatment as aggressive? And she said, ah. Right? So to her, aggressive was entirely kind of label. Uh, but actually, in relation to treatment, means you know, we're going to treat you really well. But for patients, aggressive when it applies to your cancer or your loved one's cancer or whatever, or even to the treatment, the metaphor is much more alive. So you can make people. Reflect, help people reflect about the, the uses of very conventional methods in a way that is helpful. But you can't beat them over the head about crossing the speech boundaries. I feel very strongly about this in the book. So, oh no, we don't have that to the verb, and uh, we don't have to do the analysis. Why? Uh, and similarly, we don't bother too much with prepositions or things like that. You still can, but they don't count it, but then we present, you've got to try to give people something that can relate to uh, Otherwise, you basically. Okay, so how do I find about violence and during that? We have plenty of evidence that violence principles can be counterproductive. And this is uh, one of the clearest examples. Somebody whose cancer is incurable and becomes curable who says, I feel such a failure that I'm not going to be back. So notice that people often ask us, but how do you know whether a metaphor is working well for somebody or not? And basically, well, because you do not ask them directly. So we say we have to look for evidence. Uh, and so here the person feels a failure, but actually she not say the treatment didn't work. And that is followed immediately by not being in battle. So this is one of the most negative consequences of the kind of battle training the violence metaphors, because when a kind of when illness is incurable, that corresponds to losing the battle. And so people can feel a sense of responsibility when in fact they're not in war. However, we have also found that metaphor, this kind of metaphor can be entirely as well. Some people find meaning and purpose in that metaphor, especially when the cancer is still treatable. And I think we need to recognize that. So what we say is to the healthcare professionals and those people know, don't need to use those metaphors, don't impose them. And also question them if they uh, if they're this entirely like this. But some people, so some people some of the time make it useful. And this person says cancer and finally it is something to be proud of. When we look at jury metaphor, we found a similar pattern. So jury metaphors don't have any obvious harmful uh, effects in the way the virus metaphors have. And in some cases, uh, they help uh, express even the concomitant in the very negative experience of cancer. So one person said, my journey may not be smooth, but it certainly makes me look up and take notice of the scenery. And this is, and you may be able to relate to that, that when you have a serious diagnosis, Sometimes you reassess your life and you appreciate some things more, or you meet people with whom you have a very strong, uh, a very strong sense of bond. And the Jerry metaphor provides for that 
by the end of the idea of machinery. But for other people, okay, and other people hate the idea of a journey because they think it's not too cliche. So they say, I don't want to hear a journey again, etc. And then there are uh, journeys that are used to express frustration. So the person says, How the hell am I supposed to know how to navigate this world that nobody wants to be on when I've never done before? So, what we tend to say in terms of our findings, and we've written articles and books, the ones with more detail, that people only have to use a variety of metaphors to describe the crime, but violence and journey metaphors are the most frequent types, especially in uh, the patient language, but in fact, in the other sections of the course. We have evidence of potentially harmful effects of violence metaphors, but both violence and journey metaphors can be used in entirely and disentirely way, ways, and that is the crucial distinction. In terms of applications, making healthcare professionals, charity campaigners, etc., more aware of how these different metaphors work in terms of how they can help and how they can be harmful can increase sensitivity and effectiveness in communication with people with cancer and about people with cancer. And you know, the charities that use gun call slogans are actually kind of aware of what they're doing, but we were invited. To talk to the two main kinds of in other people, they were interested in what we uh, had to say. Also, a greater awareness of variation in the use of metaphor can help people switch away from a distinction between this is always good and this is always bad, and having a kind of more nuanced approach to the metaphor they use and the metaphor they hear. However, and this is another lesson, people tend to have a prescriptive approach to language. So people are looking to us to say, tell us what to do, right? What is it and what is And this came about, particularly in a session, how much is it done? Okay. We uh, worked with a group of um, people from the local community in Northwest England throughout the project, who worked as kind of consultants for people doing uh, research in relation to cancer. They were not researchers. They had the experience of caring for someone with cancer, of having cancer, but they understood what research was. And it was very useful and refreshing to talk to them on a regular point because they gave us the perspectives that we wouldn't get from academics. And so one day um, we were presenting, to begin with, they mostly gave us their ideas, and then we started presenting our findings to them. And um, one of the people in that group said, okay, so you've done all this work. Are you going to come up with a list of good metaphors and a list of bad metaphors so we know what to do? Okay? And so I said, and I heard the first thing, well, it's more complicated than that. And it's not the same powers and this powers and metaphors can be even more than whatever, which was true to the findings of the research. But when I went home, I thought that was really a kind of, you know, when as an academic, your best answer is it's more complicated than you think. <laughs> Even though it's true, it's a very unsatisfactory answer. At the same time, we could not take that prescriptive approach because that would also have been, uh, that would have contradicted what we found. And so I came up with a different idea, which is the metaphor menu for people with cancer. So what we put together is a collection of quotes, and the we had 17 quotes. Um, from people with cancer, not that just from our data, uh, accompanied by images that involve different metaphors. And the idea is so the, the metaphor of the restaurant, the menu, is it wants to emphasize choice. In other words, when, when you have a menu, hopefully everybody would like at least one dish, not everybody would like the same dishes, etc. And unless, okay, somebody is critical of meat eaters or whatever, there's no value judgment associated with the fact that I prefer chicken and meat. Right, so that's the idea, it's choice, it's not prescription. So this is an example. I can't, the metaphor menu exists. Uh, I also give you one example of a new metaphor from the medical menu. Uh, one person said, cancer is part of me. The cure for cancer is the acceptance of it. To heal is to meet the rogue self within and convince them to sing in tune with the rest of the body. So you can see that the cells are still rogue cells. But the goal is reestablishing musical harmony rather than fighting and eliminating the component. So this is in a way more consistent with those traditions of thought, including in, in China, where illness is about loss of balance in the body rather than external invasion, which is kind of the more dominant way of conceiving of I'm generalizing at a very high level, but in a sort of more interesting 
So we got this menu, right? And uh, I've been working with an oncologist, Alison Berger, who was on the slide at the beginning. Uh, she um, specialized in prostate cancer, and she started distributing the menu uh, uh, to her patients. And we got 15 so far, not many of you. 15 uh, patients have received the, question, the, the menu, and it's accompanied at the moment by a questionnaire that asks people questions about it. We're trying to file it to see if it's useful. And the questions include to what extent do you think the medical menu could be helpful for other patients? And we've got the Python scale, so that one is not really useful and that is useful. And, and then out of all the metaphors, we ask them which do you think are the most helpful? We also have most contactors and a whole bunch of questions. Now, the mean answer to the question uh, about usefulness is 3.2 out of 5, which isn't very high. Um, but on the other hand, it's only one group of patients. So these are, these are prostate cancer, people with prostate cancer, so their uh, main duty is their sense of ability. So we would like to sort of have a, a larger uh, thing. In fact, they're interested in the medical menu of uh, here. Uh, in terms of uh, the most helpful metaphor is this, I can't give you all the results because that's the time. This is the uh, this was regarded as the most uh, helpful metaphor by six out of fifteen people. This is from our data. Plenty of us have been through it and come out the other side. So imagine it's a bit like a scary camera, right? The most scary place is that you will eventually stop and you can get off. Be strong, be brave, and be okay, and we will be here to hold your hand if you need it. This is typical of the online forum. Where people support each other. Of course, it assumes that the cancer is physical. Uh, but that's the really metaphor people like most. Okay, so progress so far, getting to the end. Difficulties, okay. Clinician priorities. One time I was, I was put at a meeting with Alison Berger, the oncologist, and she and shop. And then she rang me and she said, I'm really sorry, uh, one of my patients went into cardiac arrest while he was having chemotherapy. And I said, Oh, that's not. You can miss anything for that. But basically, you, we have our own pressures, but we're working with clinicians who have massive pressures. And so there are eggs and flow in the collaboration, depending on um, uh, what else she's doing. And the menu is definitely not yet taken off. Uh, there's a lot of interest, but it hasn't sort of had the success that I hope for it. One of the issues that people have pointed out is that because we, we quote exactly from the original sources, uh, some of the metaphors may be hard to be, for people to make sense of out of context. So I may well have to go against my instinct as a linguist where I want to reproduce exactly what people said and rephrase them in a way that it makes sense to their standard. So it's a kind of work in progress. However, uh, actually, it has been used, I have it on the slide, it has, however, been used by some students at the University of Berkeley as inspiration for an app they do for children with cancer. And uh, it is, as we speak, being used to in a kind of train session for clinicians in Italy. But this project has been successful beyond my wildest dreams. So we published an article in the NHS for Portugal Calitica, the hardest paper I've had to write because I'm going to use for three and a half thousand words. And I said, well, I can't write the paper that that's short, but we did. And it was the top most downloaded paper in that journal for the first year. It was unexpected. It said, it said more readers than all my publications. Together, you know, these days. We've written blogs and uh, talks, and we've been invited to speak to charities, hospices, and the general public. We've had testimonials of people saying, I now give your ideas and it's what I do, so we've got sort of some evidence. And uh, we've the, the, the research has been reported in lots of music. Which, um, oh yeah, and one lesson here is people sometimes think that to, to communicate your findings to people outside the discipline, you have to dumb down. I've never really found that. You just need to share your most technical terms. But basically, people get it. In fact, the people who speak to about this research are often better communicating methods than I am. So it's just a matter of sharing some of the stuff that really you don't necessarily need. But, but I've never felt that it hasn't come down very much at all. But I'll give you a lesson now, and I'm really there, uh, which is to do with the media, right? Now, I have to say, I never thought that my research would ever end up in the media. And one day, the family body was doing a press release about the search, and they said to them, we did a press release on Monday morning, will you be available on the phone to take the calls from the press? And they said, I'm not going to get the calls from the press. So I went to my office a bit late, and by that point, I'd already missed two national newspapers. 
there is huge interest in this stuff. But the problem is that somebody writes the headlines. And I'll give you uh, just three examples. So in Italian, we form that study the money line is roughly down to network to make sure we need this to work. That is not what we said. <laughs> The main line, this is more subtle. This is that uh, we analyze tumor in the data class. Uh, last time we released the best medicine for cancer patients, sufferers, not to see, get through the remit, and create a sense of community. Review study of 1.5 million foreign hosts. No, 1.5 million works. No, this is what I have to look at. And then uh, I had an interview with this on the phone with journalists from the New York Times, and, uh, and I said that. Um, uh, the, the healthcare professionals in our data use violence metaphors less than patients, right? So the doctors in our data use violence metaphors less than patients. So they uh, cheer up the dog and the title was Finally, words are rarer among Jewish doctors. <laughs> so then somebody who had a couple of followers tweeted it Study at Michael University finds. The UK doctors use violence metaphors less than US doctors. <laughs> <laughs> and the thing is, we didn't look at US doctors. So then I did a study with an American colleague. So we sort of did the research in retrospect, speaking with the new German and we didn't find evidence that the US doctors use a metaphor. So basically, that is that. Is that. Uh, final lesson number 10 to personalize. So, um, when you do research on these things, most of this stuff is too big for us to drive, basically. I'm kind of naive when I start doing this stuff. Um, so, first of all, you need to think about your own distress, I hope you can be distressing me about, and the back of your uh, collaborators. And I would go to kind of running backwards, you know, provide support for people who spend the whole day analyzing and then the black hair, uh, the data set or the cancer data set. So, you've got them to look after yourself, you've got to look after your colleagues. In fact, I have no motivation for looking at cancer metaphors with personal anyway. Um, but also, um, you get different kinds of responses from people, and I haven't got the quotes here deliberately, but I'll just give you two examples. I did a public lecture in Manchester where I live, and then at the end, I had questions such as um, My father has cancer, and uh, incurable cancer, and uh, my mother doesn't want to talk about it. What should I do? This is your, not your normal QA. Right? But you can't say sorry, I'm doing this, so I can't say anything. So basically, you get a different kind of reaction, and, and then you need to be ready for it. The other thing that I get when I try to go the basis is that people find out about the next menu and they send me stuff for the menu, which could be their own diaries, but sometimes it could be poems written by a dead family member, and they say, look, you know, this experience would be totally meaningless for us, and so I want you to use. Extracts from my uh, daughter's poems in your menu. We need to do that. And those emails are very hard to respond to. So, so you can't separate, it's very difficult to set up a signature. You can't separate the, the academic from the personal. And I was saying at dinner last night that I spent my day writing very short emails back to people I've been head of the department for six years. I write emails that say one word, yes, or go ahead, or whatever. But when I get emails like that, I have to, have to make time and space to say what do I say to the person. When in most cases, I can't use those uh, metaphors in the menu for different reasons, but I also cannot say that. So the personal side uh, of, of all of this uh, becomes entangled with the professional side. And there's nothing much we have to do about that. But I have a little more positive note. Um, first of all, our data, especially on cancer, but for everything else, Gives a, in a sense, it's distressing, but in other senses, it gives you uh, a sense of people's resilience in the face of adversity. And also, you see how, for example, when people interact online, how much they support and encourage each other. So, you, you, it's heartening as well as distressing. And one of the lines of research that we've done is looked at cancer jokes in on the online forum dedicated to cancer. And it's been, it's been two pages in the Journal of Romantics on this. And, she and I have a, a chapter in a in an identity collection by Brad and and This is just one example of it. There are jokes. There is a funny joke on uh, one of the threads on the online forum, which is actually dedicated to cancer humor. But one of the uh, running jokes is to do with playing cancer cards. So using cancer as an excuse 
to get the ratio of treatment to get how this continuum works through. And this is one example. What's funny is someone just ran and asked me to do some stuff for me to see today and in the ground. And I said, I was so tired to do it tonight. Can I start new stuff for today now? But actually, what I wanted to do was like this. So you get all sorts of things from the day and the kind of humanity of people trying to be including by a human. Um, but the final thing is the positive thing. So I have to say, when I joined Brown a long time ago, um, and I reflected on the name of the Association of Researching and Applying Experts. At the time, you know, I done my PhD on poetry, um, you know, which of course is a very worthwhile endeavor. I was thinking, yeah, I research medical, but I can't think that I would ever apply. Who would be interested? And actually, I was wrong. Uh, people get it. People do get it. People can see it as an actress. And so if we're able to communicate with them what things matter to them, it is actually not that hard to apply. Okay, thank you. Thank you very much indeed. We do have 10 minutes for okay. questions. So, anybody like up the back? Oh, that was an actually ideal talk for these comments. It's a perfect example of research and applying metaphor. Thank you very much. Um, I'm reminded of a cartoon that's famous of a patient talking to the doctor in the doctor's office. And it's a big knife sticking out of the back of the patient. The doctor goes, Good news, only a metaphor. And you know, that goes to me on my dog. So. <laughs> <laughs> my, my question is when you're doing analysis of metaphors, for example, these patients have hearing voices, 